if you've ever looked at some logic and you've seen all these symbols flying around the page and you've wondered, like, what does it all mean? Well, I'm glad you've come here because I'm going to explain. <laughs> Welcome to Attic Philosophy. On this channel, we're discussing issues in metaphysics, the mind, language, social issues. In this series of videos, we're looking at the basics of logic. And in this video, we're talking about the most basic logic of all, propositional logic. This is the most basic type of logic. It's the easiest one. It's the one we always start with. In this video, we're going to be focusing in on the language of propositional logic. So we're going to look at how that language is made up, how we understand the structure of the language, a few kind of things going on there. And then in the next video, we're going to be looking at what the sentences of that language mean, how we work out whether they're true or false. OK, so the language of propositional logic is made up starting with some sentence letters. OK, so if you remember from the last video, I talked about how logic is content neutral. We basically don't deal in English sentences. We deal with some sentence letters. Let's call those P, Q and R. And if we need more of these, we can go P1, P2, P3. Different logicians call these different things. Sometimes they're called atoms or atomic sentences or sentence variables or primitive propositions. It kind of doesn't matter. We're going to call them sentence letters. OK, so we've got our sentence letters, P, Q and R and so on. And then we start putting these together to make more complex sentences. And we do this with the connectives. So we're going to have connectives and or not if then and if and only if. And often philosophers abbreviate if and only if to if with two f. So if, if you ever see that written down, iff, -F, it means if and only if. So these are the five connectives we're going to look at. And we're going to have a symbol, a shorthand symbol for each one. And they go like this. For and, it looks like this. For or, it looks like this. For not, it looks like this. For if then, it's an arrow. And for if and only if, it's an arrow going in both directions. OK, how are you going to remember these symbols? Yeah, it's kind of tricky, but there's a few kind of um, like tricks and hints you can use. So the and this one, uh, to me, the, the, the kind of the upward pointing wedge, it looks a little bit like an N. So it's like the N in and. The V, the wedge pointing downward for or. Uh, no idea how you remember that. Other than, it, you know, the and one and the or one are kind of the same. So you're going to worry about which one points up and which one points down. So you've got to remember the and one is like the N in and and the or is the other one. Not. To me, this is a bit like a kind of a crossing out symbol. A not is like, you know, crossing something out, saying not that. So you can remember that this one is the not. The arrow, if then, this one's simpler because the arrow leads you from the antecedent, the if bit, to the consequent, the then bit. OK, so it's an arrow for if then. And if and only if, well, if and only if, it's, it's like a two way if then. It's like, you know, an inference going this way and an inference going back the other way as well. If and only if. OK, so that's why that one is a two way arrow. OK, so you've just basically got to learn those symbols. So once we've got our primitive sentences and we've got the connectives, we can start building together more complex sentences. So, for instance, we can have not P. We can have P and Q. We can have Q or R. If P, then Q. And we can have Q if and only if R. OK, so they're, they're, they're simple sentences, but they're still complex because they've got a connective binding together some more sentences. But then we can take those sentences that we've just made and combine those together with a connective to make even more complex sentences. So things like this, not not P, or we could have P and Q, or R. Or we could have if P, then Q, or not R. And things like that. OK, so we can take some sentences that we've already made and we can combine them together 
into new sentences, more complex sentences, and we can keep repeating that process. All of the sentences that we can make like that are part of our language of propositional logic. So these sentences together, and all the other ones we can make like that, these are called complex sentences. Okay, so our primitive sentences, they're just the, the sentence letters, the complex sentences, these are all the ones that we can build by combining sentence letters with connectives in some way or other. So now I'm going to give you an official definition of what counts as a sentence of propositional logic. But in order to do this, I, I need to introduce a convention, okay? So if we go back here, we've got all of these different sentences, all these different complex sentences, and sometimes I, I want to be able to describe any old sentence. So not a, not a specific sentence like that one or that one, but I, I'm just talking about like any old sentence. I'm just going to call it A, or I'm going to call it B, or I'm going to call it C, and if I need more I'll go like A1, A2, and so on. So the P's and the Q's, they are specific sentence letters. The A, the B, and the C, they're just any old sentence, an arbitrary sentence, when I'm just talking about any particular, you know, any old sentence. So now let's give this definition of what counts as a sentence of propositional logic. All of the sentence letters are sentences on their own. So P is a sentence, Q is a sentence just on its own. And if any old sentence A and B are already built, if they're already sentences, then so are not A, A and B, A or B, if A then B, A if and only if B. They all count as sentences. Third part of the definition, that's it. Nothing else counts as a sentence. So the only way you can get a sentence of propositional logic is either by it being a, a sentence letter or it's some combination of sentence letters and connectives put together in the way we've described in this part here. So sticking with that definition for a moment, here is a slightly different way of presenting that information. We can present the same information just like this. Okay, what counts as our language? It's a primitive sentence letter, or it's a negation of a sentence. It's a conjunction of a sentence, an and, a disjunction, an or, an implication, if A then B, or a by implication, A if and only if B. Sometimes this kind of way of writing down the language, it's called the signature of the language. What counts as a properly grammatically formed sentence? Okay, we don't really need to go into that in too much detail. Now, actually, there's something that's not quite right with the definition I've just given you. There's something missing out, and that thing concerns ambiguity. Look at a sentence like this. P and Q or R. Okay, so I could I could build that sentence from primitive sentence letters P, Q and R and the connectives and an or. But we've got a problem then. W what does this sentence mean? If we took P to mean Anna's going to go to the party, Q to mean Beck's going to go, and R to mean Kath's going to go, does this sentence mean this? That is, either both Anna and Beck are going to go or Kath's going to go, or does it mean this? This would mean Anna's going to go, and also either Beck or Kath are going to go. How do we know which disambiguation of that sentence is right? Well, the idea is we, we never encounter that situation because we are always going to build perfectly disambiguated sentences. So if you think about it, we, we're never just going to get hit with a sentence kind of like this out of nowhere. We are going to construct that sentence, and either we're going to start with P and Q, put that together in a sentence, and then add or R to it. And in that case, our brackets would go like this. Or we would start with Q or R. So we'd, start, we'd take Q, we'd take R, and we'd put them into a sentence. And then we would add to that sentence and P or P and. And in that case, the brackets go like this. So the order in which we construct the sentence is what determines the structure of it when we work out what it means. So going back to our definition of what counts as a sentence of the language, we can now correct that slight defect by putting in brackets here. So whenever we form a sentence, a new sentence, we'll put a bracket around it. That way, we're never going to have any ambiguity. I haven't put a bracket around the not A, basically because you never ever need it, okay? If you're just sticking in a negation in front of a sentence, 
there's no possibility of ambiguity creeping in there. So we can ignore that. I put these brackets in red here because they kind of do need to be there for the official definition so that we don't get ambiguity. But in practice, often you don't need them. We're going to kind of learn a bit of this as we go along. So sometimes the, the official structure of a sentence will have loads and loads of brackets in it. That kind of makes it difficult to read. We can kind of ignore some of those brackets. OK, so the, the, the general rule of thumb is you, you're always allowed to take out brackets as long as you don't thereby introduce any ambiguity. We're going to work out that as we go. Syntax trees. So this idea that the structure of a sentence, the kind of grammar of it, reflects the way that we built the sentence in the first place is very nicely illustrated by this idea of a syntax tree. So let me explain how that works. Let's take a really simple sentence. It's syntax tree, it's a P, it's a Q, and they were put together using conjunction. So basically all we're doing in there is we're kind of saying, I've got P, I've got Q, and I'm putting them together. I'm joining them into a sentence with the conjunction symbol, the and symbol. Now that seems really simple, but it's really useful in practice because let's see how that applies to big bigger and potentially ambiguous sentences. So let's look at these two sentences and how the syntax trees will differ, reflecting the different ways those sentences were built. For this one, it begins with a P and a Q put together with an AND symbol, just like this one over here on the left. And then we take that part and we take R and we put it all together with an OR. So this is the syntax tree and it corresponds to this sentence. Now let's look at this one over here on the right. It begins with a Q and an R put together with the OR symbol. And then there's a P here and all of that is put together with the AND symbol. Here is the syntax tree for that sentence. So even though those two sentences look kind of the same, these two syntax trees here and here demonstrate illustrate quite easily how those sentences differ in meaning. A little bit of terminology for dealing with trees is helpful. Whenever we've got a tree, we've got the bit at the top of it. That's called the root. That's this bit here because all of the trees we do in logic for some reason they're, they're upside down. So the, the roots at the top. So here's the root. The leaves are here. They're the bits where you can't go any further. And all of these bits are called nodes. OK, so everything that isn't a line is called a node. In a syntax tree, the root is the main connective. OK, the main connective, that's an important concept. So in this sentence here, it's a conjunction, an AND, because the main connective is this symbol. In a syntax tree, the leaves, they are always sentence letters. So if you're drawing a syntax tree, you've got to make sure you've gone far enough. You've kind of deconstructed the sentence so that you've got right down to the leaves, the P's, the Q's and the R's that make up that sentence. Another concept we're going to need to talk about is subsentences, the subsentences of a sentence. These are all the sentences that you build along the way as you make up that whole sentence. OK, let me give you an example. We're sticking with this sentence, our, our old friend P and Q or R. It has the following sub sentences. First up, there's the sentence letters P, Q, R. And then we took P and Q and we put them together into P and Q. So that's a sub sentence. And then there's the whole sentence itself. So this sentence has one, two, three, four, five sub sentences. When we're doing sub sentences, don't forget to include the whole sentence itself. That counts as a sub sentence. We'll get on to a bit later why sub sentences are important for the moment. We're just kind of getting to grips with the concept. Here's a good way of working out what the sub sentences are. We're using a syntax tree. So here's the syntax tree for this sentence. Each node here, 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 here and here corresponds to a sub sentence. So the sentence letters correspond to these. This node here represents P and Q. And this node here, the root right at the top, represents the whole sentence. So if you're trying to work out the sub sentences of a sentence, a good way to do it is draw the syntax tree and write down one sentence for each node on that tree. Five nodes here. So we've got five sub sentences there. Subsentences are going to come into play when we are working out 
what a sentence means. All the sentences we looked at so far, they've been quite simple, but they can be arbitrarily complex. Sometimes you can get really tricky to work out what they mean. So we do it one little step at a time, okay? We first work out the meaning of the most basic sub-sentences, and we work our way upwards, getting more and more complex until we get to the sentence that we're interested in, okay? So like I said at the beginning, logic is about these little steps and combining little steps into big, complex, clever things. Okay, that is all for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I kind of admit it's been kind of dry, but your hard work here is gonna be paying off next video where we're gonna be talking about meaning and truth in logic, like what does it all mean? And we're gonna be using the concepts that we've learned from this video. I hope you stick around for that. If you wanna get more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell button to get updates. I will see you next time. <laughs>